Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, so we'll be starting out again with this uh, class on neuroradiologic anatomy part five, and today we'll be covering CT imaging. So let's get right into it. So we'll be starting off with the axial sections, and um, this is going to rely a lot on what we've already learned previously with the MRI anatomy. Okay, more or less, it is quite the same, except there are a few things you'll be able to pick out with CT as compared to an MRI. It's important to note that the bone is going to be a lot more obviously seen with the CT. Okay, and the bone is going to lead to some artifacts. Okay, like if you can see, there's a little bit of blurring around the bony edges over here. So that's also an important thing to realize that bone does lead to some artifacts in a CT. Okay, now coming to the anatomy itself per se, let's discuss whatever we can see in the axial scans. We're going to start from superiorly and then go inferiorly. So here, starting from the superior end, right? So this is the interhemispheric fissure. We have got the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, okay? And then we have got the pre-central pre gyrus over here, the central sulcus over here, and the post-central gyrus over here, okay? As we go inferiorly, we're going to start seeing more and more of the white matter, okay? So here we've got the frontoparietal white matter, also known as the centrum semi veil okay? And um, one second. You got the superior frontal and the middle frontal gyrus. Here you can see the pre-central gyrus over here and the much thinner post-central gyrus over here. Okay. And behind the post-central gyrus, you'll have the superior parietal lobule and then you have the interparietal sulcus and then you have the in inferior parietal lobule over here. As we go further inferiorly, you can see more of the centrum semi -oval over here. This entire white matter is centrum semi -oval. You can see the quite thick pre-central gyrus and the much thinner post-central gyrus. Okay, here it's a central sulcus. Behind the post-central gyrus, now at a much lower level, you will see the inferior parietal lobule. So this is the supramarginal gyrus, which is the superior part of the inferior parietal lobule, and this is the angular gyrus, which is the inferior part of the inferior parietal lobule. Okay, now as we go further more inferiorly, we will fi finally start seeing a very important structure, that is the lateral ventricle. So in the lateral ventricle here, there's a lateral ventricle body. The lateral ventricle body will be first covered superiorly by the corpus callosum. So this is a corpus callosum body, and this is also the or laterally to the lateral ventricle, you have the body of the caudate over here. The centrum semi -oval will turn into the corona radiata over here at this level. Apart from that, you can see the frontal white matter, the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus. This is the pre-central sulcus, and here is a continuation of the inferior parietal lobby with supramarginal and angular gyrus. Here you can see the parietal occipital sulcus, in front of which you have the precuneus, and behind which you have the cuneus over here. As we go slightly lower down, you can start seeing the lateral ventricle a lot more clearly now. So this is the lateral ventricle body. The lateral ventricle on both sides is separated by the septum pellucidum. So you can see this thin structure. In some cases, this septum pellucidum will be separated into two leaflets. So you can sometimes have two leaflets over here. That is called a cavum septum pellucidum, a very normal anatomical variant. The only concern it might pose is when you're doing uh, any surgery in this region and you can get stuck between the leaflets of the septum pellucidum while thinking you're inside the ventricle. Okay, so this, uh, at this level, you have the lateral ventricle bodies and they're trying to form the frontal horns on both sides and the atrium on both sides. This is the corpus callosum anterior body and this is the corpus callosum posterior body. You have the caudate nucleus lying lateral to the lateral ventricle and the corona radiata. As we come down a little bit more inferiorly, things do start to get a little bit more complicated, but we can still pick out a few obvious structures. Okay, so as you can see, the lateral ventricle is forming the frontal horn now and the atrium. Okay, so in relation to the frontal horn, laterally you'll have the caudate nucleus head. Okay, and in relation to the atrium over here, posteriorly you'll have the occipital lobe. At the same level, you'll also have this big gray matter over here, which is the thalamus. You can also make out this triangular gray matter over here, which is the lentricul lenticulate nucleus and the globus pallidus. In between the lenticulate and the caudate nucleus head, you will have the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And in between the lenticulate and the thalamus, you will have here the posterior internal capsule. Okay, so these are structures you can make out on CT also. You have the thalamus connected to each other by the massa intermedia over here. Okay, and just posterior to that, if you can make out these two structures over here, that's the internal cerebral veins. You can also see if you come lateral to this putamen. <coughs> Excuse me. You can't really make out the claustrum in the extreme capsule, but you can see the insula cortex over here. You have the sylvan fissure. Above the sylvan fissure, you have the frontal operculum, and below the sylvan fissure, you have the superior temporal gyrus. 
Okay, coming a little bit more inferiorly, the lateral ventricle opens up into the third ventricle over here. So if we go previously, this here right was the foramen Munro, right here, into which it opens into the third ventricle. Just at the medial border of the foramen Munro, you will have the fornix over here. Okay. So now this is the third ventricle. On either side of the third ventricle, the thalamus has ended. As you can see, no well, no clear gray matter structures over here. So here would be the hypothalamus in this region. You can still see some um, gray matter anteriorly. So that is a corded nucleus head. This hypodense structure over here is the lamina terminalis system. As you can see, the frontal lobes have started to narrow down. Okay, and we are approaching the ACF base. So this is the uh, this is the olfactory gyri over here of the frontal lobe. This is the sylvian fissure demarcating your frontal lobe anteriorly and the temporal lobe posteriorly. Okay, that's you can see this is the atrium on both sides with the scoroid plexus inside it, and here is the internal cerebral veins joining together to form the vein of Galen over here. This structure here is the basal vein of Rosenthal. And this very obvious calcified structure behind the third ventricle is the pineal gland. Okay, and if we come a little bit more inferiorly, we we'll start seeing the suprasilar structures. Okay, so below the third ventricle, below the hypothalamus, you should start seeing the suprasilar structures. Now we can make out this is the mammillary body, the two globular structures below the hypothalamus. Okay, and here is the hypothalamus. Okay, and at the level of the orbits, these two straight looking gyri that you see is the gyrus rectus. So you should be able to clearly identify what is the gyrus rectus. So to identify the gyrus rectus, you should come down to this level where you can see only a narrow portion of the frontal lobe. And then this area, this region would be the gyrus rectus, not higher than this. Okay, apart from that, you can see a hyperdense MCA over here. This is a sylvian fissure. Okay, and another important structure over here at this level would be the uncus. So always important to identify the uncus and look for the cisternal spaces next between the uncus and the crust cerebra over here to make sure there's no cerebral edema and the cisterns are not obliterated. Okay, apart from that, you can also see the perimesencephalic cisterns over here and the quadrigeminal cistern over here. This is the colliculi and the tectum, the aqueduct is over here. This here is the parahippocampal gyrus. Okay, if we come further down, you can now start seeing the infundibulum, in front of which you have the optic chiasm over here. Okay, a very important bony structure, that is the anterior clinoid process, is obvious here. Okay, and then you can also see the other structures we discussed, the suprasellar, suprasellar cisterns, the quadrigeminal cisterns, the perimesophilic cisterns, the parahippocampal gyrus, and the uncus. Right. So if we come further down, a lot more of the orbital anatomy also becomes obvious. You can see the optic, the orbital portion of the optic nerve. The muscles that we have discussed previously on MRI anatomy, this is the orbit with the lengths. Okay. Apart from that, you also have the important cellar structure. So now you can see the cellar testica clearly at a much lower level. Behind which you'll have the dorsum cellar and anterior to which you'll have the tuberculum cellar. And here you have the anterior clinoid process. The slightly hypertense structure just medial to the anterior clinoid process will be the ICA. This is a C5 with a clinoidal segment of the ICA. Right here, posterior to the dorsum cella, you will have the midbrain. So at the level of the midbrain, anterior to that, you'll find this hypertense structure that is the basilar artery. If you come down a little bit further, the midbrain will start turning into the bridge shaped structure that is the pons you'll have the basilar artery lying anterior to it. The cellar testicle is ending, and once that starts happening, you'll start seeing this hyperdense structure next to the cella, connecting the anterior clinoid process and posteriorly the petrous apex, so that is a cavernous sinus over here. Okay, and then as we go further down, the pons becomes a little bit even more obvious. You can clearly make out the petrous body and the petrous apex over here. So this is the petrous apex, which connects with the clival bone. So this is the clival bone. And clivus, obviously, anteriorly, will have the sphenoid sinus. This is the sphenoid sinus. This is the middle cranial fossa. And there's a slightly hypodense structure here at the level of the petrous apex. So we know that would be the Meckel's cave.
We come down a little bit further. The pons turns in the medulla. And we've already discussed this anatomy previously. The thing to really discuss, the fourth ventricle is ending over here. And on either side of the fourth ventricle, you have the tonsils over here. Behind which you have the cisterna magna. Sometimes what can happen in really old people is that you can develop these calcifications at the insertions of the extraocular muscles. So there's no need to get confused with something pathological over here. In older individuals, these calcifications are benign and they're quite normal. Okay, so now that we have discussed the axial anatomy and we got a clear idea of what we can identify in a CT, we'll see the same structures even on coronal and sagittal imaging. So on coronal imaging, we're going to go from anterior to posterior. Here, as you can see, the eyeball is ended. This is the orbit now. And um, you cannot as clearly make out the orbital structures as you could on an MRI, but you can still see this will be the optic nerve. And these are all the muscles surrounding the orbit, the optic nerve. You can also make, see, as you can see, this is still the ACM base. You're clearly seeing the orbital roof. So the entire structure would still be the frontal lobe. Until you see a break in the orbital roof, you cannot consider the existence of the temporal lobe. So once the orbital roof breaks, that is the location of the sylvian fissure over here. And below which you'll have the temporal lobe and above which you'll have the frontal lobe. Okay, so until the orbit, orbital roof breaks, there's no existence of the temporal lobe. So here you have the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus, and the or olfactory gyri. Right at the medial edge, you'll have the gyrus rectus over here. Okay. And another structure, as we go more posteriorly, once the orbital rule breaks, you have the sylvan fissure, and then you have the temporal pole over here. And then you finally start seeing the lateral ventricle also. This is the frontal horn on both sides. This will be the corpus callosum, this will be the body, and this will be the corpus callosum rostrum. Okay, above which you have the, as we know, just above the corpus callosum you have the cingulate gyrus, and above that you have the cingulate sulcus. As we go more posteriorly, we'll start seeing more of the structures that we've already seen previously. So you've got the lateral ventricle frontal horn separated by the septum pellucidum, the corpus callosum lying above that. This will be the subcalosal area. This here is the sphenoid sinus, above which we have the planum sphenoidal and the anterior clinoid process on both sides. Okay, you still have the sylvian fissure over here, below which you have the temporal lobe and above which you have the frontal lobe. You can start seeing the insula over here, surrounded by the sylvian fissure. And on both sides, the sylvian fissure will extend around the insula and form the periinsula or the circular sulcus. This here is the M1. MCA, which is slightly hyperdense. Okay, so, and here is the A to ACA, again, slightly hyperdense. There are a few structures you can still identify the caudate nucleus head, the putamen, the internal capsule anterior limb, but really not necessary to pick up in a CT as much as in an MRI. Okay, as we go more and more posterior, there will be a few structures which become a little bit more obvious. So as you can see, the sphenoid sinus is starting to end here. Okay, above which we have the pituitary gland. So this is the cella. You have the infundibulum over here. Okay, so this will be the hypothalamus over here. On either side, this is the ICA, which is slightly atherosclerotic and calcified. Okay, then apart from that, we can still make out the sylvian fissure and the periinsula sulcus on both sides. Apart from that, more or less, you've got the similar structures that we've already seen previously. As you go more and more posteriorly, the lateral ventricle will start turning finally into the uh, atrium on both sides as well. So this is the lateral ventricle body. As we go more and more posterior, it become the atrium. Corpus callosum uh, forming the roof of the lateral ventricle body on both sides. Above the corpus callosum, you have the cingulate gyrus on both sides, above which you have the cingulate sulcus. So this is the cingulate sulcus. This is the centrum semi ovale which is the frontoparietal white matter, which at the level of the lateral ventricles is going to form the corona radiator. Okay, so as we go more posteriorly, we've got the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, this is the midbrain, this is the cerebral peduncle, so as you can see, the internal capsule starts from the cerebral peduncle, which is going to jo join the midbrain over here. We've already discussed this previously, the temporal lobe anatomy, as we know, if the temporal horn is not seen, we know that the a hippocampus does not exist till that point. So here, as you can see, once the temporal horn is seen, 
we can say that whatever structure is there in the floor of the temporal horn is the hippocampus. So just anterior to the hippocampus, when the temporal horn ends, we have the amygdala lying in the medial temporal lobe. Okay. At the medial end of the insula, connecting the temporal lobe to the gray matter over here is a temporal stem. As we go more posteriorly, you can see the brain stem clearly. You have the midbrain, you have the pons with the middle cerebral peduncle, <coughs> and you have the medulla over here. You can see the lateral ventricle has formed the atrium now. The atrium is going to be separated on both sides by the corpus callosum splenium. Okay, as you go more and more posteriorly, you just see that the atrium turns into the occipital horn. On both sides, we have already discussed this previously in the MRI anatomy also. Uh, as you go into the occipital lobe, you'll see two important sulci. One is the calcarine sulcus over here, and one will be the cingulate sulcus over here. In between the cingulate sulcus and the calcarine sulcus, you have the cingulate isthmus. Okay, and below the calcarine sulcus, you'll have the lingual gyrus. Lateral to the lingual gyrus, you'll have the lateral occipital temporal gyrus. Okay, now coming to our sagittal anatomy, same structures that we've already seen, but looking at it from a different point of view. So this is, we're going to start from the midline and go more laterally. So the midline is definitely the most complicated when it comes to sagittal anatomy. But a lot of it is quite obvious. So first, let's look at the bony anatomy. We can look at the, you find the frontal sinus here. This is the crista galli. This is your sphenoid. Okay, and then this will be the cribriform plate over here, forming the planum over here. This jutting out part is the tuberculum cella. You have the cella tersica here, and then you have the dorsum cella over here, and this whole bone behind it is going to be the clivus, finally going into the anterior end of the foramen magnum, also known as the basion. Well, the posterior end of the foramen magnum will be the ophisthion. This is the bony anatomy we need to identify. Apart from that, you can also very clearly make out some pretty good um, brain anatomy also. So the frontal uh, surface, which will be lying in the midline, will be the gyrus, rector, uh, gyrus rectus over here. And the medial hemisphere of the frontal lobe will be formed by the superior frontal gyrus over here. Below which you'll have the cingulate gyrus, below which you'll have the corpus callosum. The sagittal section demonstrates the corpus callosum anatomy quite nicely. So here you can see this part, which is below the frontal horn, is the corpus callosum rostrum. The part which bends is the genu. The part running from the genu till the posterior end is the body. And then finally, behind the third ventricle, you have the splenium over here. Okay, you can also see the cingulate gyrus, above which you'll form the cingulate sulcus. The cingulate sulcus will end posteriorly in the marginal sulcus over here. There's also a paracentral sulcus over here, which demarcates, along with the marginal sulcus, the paracentral lobule. Behind the marginal sulcus, you'll have the precuneus, behind which you'll have the parieto occipital sulcus, and below which you'll have the cuneus over here. You can also make out this hypertal structure separating the supratentorial and the infratentorial space, which will be the tentorium. And here it's hypertense because this is a straight sinus running through it. Below this, you'll have the posterior fossa where you can clearly make out the cerebellum. This will be the superior medullary velum. This will be the inferior medullary velum. This is the fourth ventricle. This is the quadrigeminal cistern over here. This is the vein of gallon coming from the internal cerebral vein, forming the vein of gallon and draining into the superior into the straight sinus. This is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. You can also make out the tectum here posteriorly. Okay. Now, as we go more and more laterally, you'll start seeing a few more structures. All right. So, as you can see, the uh, brainstem becomes less and less obvious. And as you can also make out, the midbrain is starting to connect to the thalamus now. So, that happens. Uh, the As you go more laterally, the Cerebellar peduncles will start becoming more obvious. Okay, so this is the middle cerebellar peduncle, which is becoming a little bit more obvious. You can also start seeing that the corpus callosum and the cingulate gyrus will start disappearing. As you come more laterally, they have more or less disappeared over here. And you can now start seeing that the middle cerebellar peduncle is a lot more obvious. And the brainstem has more or less disappeared and it is formed and it is connected to the thalamus now. As we come more laterally, all of these midline structures will disappear and we'll start seeing a very important and prominent structure that is a sylvian fissure. Below the sylvian fissure, we'll have the medial temporal lobe. 
and above which we'll have the frontal lobe. So here in the frontal lobe, we can make out some very important structures. Here you have the past orbitalis, the past triangularis, and the past opercularis over here. This is the insular lobe over here. As you go more and more laterally, you'll start seeing lesser and lesser of the medial structures like the insula. The insula disappears and you'll have more of the sylvian fissure and you'll have the inferior temporal gyrus and the superior temporal, sorry, the inferior frontal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus being the more obvious structures. An important uh, structure you can identify on CT scans is the arachnoid granulations within the venous sinuses. So they will just look like they are actually um, blocks or sometimes obstructions in the sinus. So you can see this is a contrast scan in which the sinus is fitting. So this is the transverse, this is a sigmoid. Okay, and there's this massive area within the transverse sinus which is not filling with contrast. So sometimes it is easily possible to misconstrue this as a sinus block, but actually it's just an arachnoid granulation. And the way to pick this up would be that usually within the arachnoid granulations, if you look closely, there will be a vein running through the center of it. Okay, same thing on axial scans also. This is the transverse sinus, is the hyperdense area behind the normal cerebellum over here. And you can see this hyperdense area within it, which is not filling. So that is the arachnoid granulation and the slightly hyperdense area within it, which is the vein. Same thing on contrast scans also. You can see the transverse sinus, this area which is not filling with contrast and there's a vein running in the center of that. Okay, now let's discuss the most important aspect of CT anatomy, that is the bony anatomy. There's a lot of important structures that we can pick up. Yeah, so we'll start with axial sections and we'll start from inferior to superior and look at the different bony structures that we can pick up. So this is very useful, especially for skull-based anatomy. So uh, let's see what are the different structures we can identify on a CT scan. So we're going to start from inferiorly. So this is obviously the mandible. So nothing really to Nothing to really pick up on this structure. This is the mandibular ramus, the mandibular foramen over here. This is the C1. We've already discussed the C1 anatomy previously. This is the lateral mass of the C1. This is the C2. There's a bony process between the mandible and the C1. This is the stalled process tip. As we come a little bit more superiorly, you can see that the C1 has ended. Now this is the foramen magnum over here. Okay, and on both, this is the occipital condyle. This is lying anterior laterally to the foramen magnum. Just at the posterior edge of the occipital condyle, you have a posterior condyle of foramen which lies here. The posterior condyle of foramen is the foramen through which the condylar emissary vein passes and this is very important for far lateral approaches. Um, just lateral to this, you'll find the mastoid tessels. A little bit more anteriorly, the uh, mandible has formed the maxilla now, uh, superiorly. So here you've got the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus is associated with two important structures. Anteriorly, you have the intraorbital canal, and medially, you'll have the nasolacrimal canal over here, which will go and end up in the inferior meatus. This is the frontal process of the maxilla, stuck, which is jutting out of the maxillary bone over here. And posteriorly, at the maxillary sinus, this here is going to start forming the pyramidal process, which will give rise to the lateral and the medial pterygoid plates in between which will be the pterygoid fossa. If at the level of the nose, you're going to have the inferior turbinate and this is the nasal septum, ending posteriorly in the nasopharynx. Apart from that, you can also pick out that this, there are two structures which, these air-filled structures running laterally from the nasopharynx. The anterior one is a eustachian tube and the posterior one is a fossa of Ros Rosenmuller. This bone you're seeing here is the stalled process. As we come a little bit more superiorly, we can still see the maxillary sinus. The maxillary bone has now formed the zygomatic process running up into the zygomatic arch on both sides. There's a fossa which forms between the maxillary bone, the uh, posterior wall of the maxilla and the um, pyramidal process. And this is the pterygopalatine fossa. Okay, so this is, and the pterygopalatine fossa will then finally open into the sclerapalatine foramen over here. So we'll see that in the next few slides. Uh, between both the pyramidal processes, you'll start developing your sphenoid bones. This is the rostrum of the sphenoid here, which is the lowest portion of the sphenoid. You have the infratemporal fossa on both sides. 
this both of these are parts of the mandible. This is the coronary process anteriorly, and this is the condylar process posteriorly. At the level of the posterior fossa, here you can see the clivus on both sides, and still still make out the posterior condylar foramen over here. This is the occipital condyle. The foramen which runs through the occipital condyle is the hypoglossal canal. It can be difficult to sometimes make out which is the hypoglossal canal and which is the jugular foramen. So here. Uh, the jugular foramen is more superior and more lateral to the hypoglossal canal. So as you can make out, the hypoglossal canal is more in the midline and will be found in the lower cut. It will be more inferior and will be present in the middle of the occipital condyle. The jugular foramen, on the other hand, will be present outside the occipital condyle, lateral to it and at the higher cut as compared to the hypoglossal canal. You can also make out the stellar process over here. This is the mastoid and this is the stylomastoid foramen through which the seventh nerve will exit. As we come more superiorly, we can make out the nasolacrimal canal over here. This is the infraorbital canal, the two important structures within the maxillary sinus. Uh, you have the pterygopalatine fossa over here. This is the rostrum of the sphenoid. This is the pyramidal process with this medial and the lateral pterygoid plates. Okay, and then the, you have the important skull base structure. So this is the clivus. This here is the jugular foramen as we have discussed. The jugular foramen's medial end will have the jugular tubercle, an important bony landmark. Okay, now there are a few important structures we can pick out on bony anatomy in the jugular foramen. So here, posteriorly and laterally, you have the pars vascularis, or par this will contain the uh, sigmoid sinus and the jugular vein. Okay, and then anteriorly and medially you have the pars nervosa. This will contain your 9th, 10th, and 11th nerves. This is separated by the jugular spine over here. Anterior to all this, you'll have the ICA, the Petrus ICA running. As we go more superiorly, this is the entry point of the Petrus ICA, and now it will form a foramen over here. This is still the jugular foramen over here. And you can see the other side jugular foramen on this side. This is the hole for the Petrus IC. This is the mastoid air cells. You still have the same structures. You have the maxillary sinus, the nasolacrimal canal, the infraorbital canal. This is the pterygopalatine fossa. And this is the rostrum of the sphenoid. The lateral pterygoid plate, the medial pterygoid plate. This is the pterygovaginal canal on both sides. And the clivus, the ICA on both sides, and the jugular foramen on this side. As we come a little bit more superiorly, you'll start finally seeing a few important foramina that we might have some difficulty picking up on a CT. So as you can see, this is the posterior border of the maxilla, and this is the pyramidal process over here. Pyramidal process, posterior border of maxilla. In between those two, you'll have the pterygopalatine fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa will then open up into the nasal cavity, through the sphenopyridal foramen over here. The foramen lacerum has a canal which connects the connects to the pterygopalatine fossa over here, and that is a vidian canal. So this is all anatomy that you can identify on a skull based CT. So you have the pterygopalatine fossa, the sphenopalatine foramen connecting it to the nasal cavity, and then running posteriorly and connecting the foramen lacerum over here, you have the vidian canal. Okay, so there are a few other, other things we can identify as we are coming more superiorly. The first foramen you will see laterally and just, it will be anterior to the ICA. The first foramen that you pick up on the lateral aspect will be the foramen spinosum. Okay, then here you have the petro-occipital fissure, which is separating the petrous bone and the occipital bone of the clibus over here. This is the jugular foramen as we already discussed and this is the ICA. As we come more superiorly, there are a few other important structures we can pick up. As you can see, now we're starting to see more and more of the nasal septum clearly. This is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. This is the cartilaginous nasal septum, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid again. Because now the maxillary sinus is starting to form the orbit more superiorly, you can make out this is the medial wall of the orbit. So this is the lacrimal bone. Just behind the lacrimal bone, you have the nasal lacrimal canal. 
Okay. So we know this is the pterygopalatine fossa because it's between the posterior wall of the maxilla and the pyramidal process. You have this canal running between the foramen lacerum over here and the pterygopalatine fossa over here. That is a vidian canal. So same structures, more or less. You have the rostrum of the sphenoid, which finally is starting to develop into the sphenoid sinus. Okay. Now looking at the MCF base, you have the first lateral hole over here, that is the foramen spinosum. The next big hole that you're finding over here is the foramen ovale. And there's also a very tiny hole over here, that is the foramen of Vesalius, which is a foramen for an emissary vein to pass between the pterygoid venous plexus and the cavernous sinus. This linear hypodensity over here is the ICA. This is the petrous horizontal portion of the petrous ICA. This is the petrous apex. This is the mastoid air cells. This is the external auditory canal. And this here is the condyla process of the mandible forming the TMG or TR, the TM junction. As we come, we have, we are not currently discussing the anatomy of the internal acoustic canal and the semicircular canals. We'll come to the temporal bone anatomy separately. It's a much bigger topic to discuss. Right. So as we come more superiorly, you can figure out a few more important structures. So we have discussed the foramen spinosum, ovale and vesalius over here. Uh, there's also another foramen which will be a little bit, which will be a lot more anterior. Okay, and it will connect to the pterygopalatine fossa. Okay, and will lie and will lie lateral to the sphenoid sinus. So that is the foramen rotundum over here. So the same thing on the other side, foramen rotundum. Okay, this is the orbit. The medial wall of the orbit will be formed by the lamina papyracea over here, and you have the ethmoid air cells lying medially to that on both sides. This is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid behind which we have the sphenoid sinus with a sphenoid septae. These are all the sphenoid septae inside it. Posterior to which we have the clivus. This is the ICA still on both sides. As we come more superiority, finally the skull base starts to end, but the anterior skull base structure is still present. So this is the orbit. The medial wall is formed by the lamina papyracea, the medial to which you have the ethmoidal air cells. This is the ACF base, which is starting to begin with the crista galli. Posteriorly, the sphenoid sinus. You can see the cellar tussic over, over here, with the posterior aspect being formed by dorsum cellae and the anterior aspect being formed by tuberculum cellae. The ACPs are starting to form over here. And just lateral to that, you'll form the superior orbital fissure. This lateral wall of the orbit is formed with the greater thing of the sphenoid. As we come more superior, once you fi finally form the antipulonic process, the canal medial to that will be the optic canal on both sides. This bone here is the superior end of the dorsum cella. This is the posterior cleral process. Okay, so now let's look at the same anatomy through coronal sections and see what we can pick up. Uh, more or less the same structure. So this here, on, as you can make out, we are not seeing the orbit. So this is posterior, but the orbits have already ended. Okay, so this is the planar sphenoidal. This is the sphenoid sinus. So as you can see, this is quite posterior now. Uh, the posterior edge of the orbital roof or the ACF base is formed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid. This is the lesser wing of the sphenoid on both sides. This is a superior orbital fissure. And this is the middle cranial fossa. This here is the sphenopalatine foramen. And this here is the pterygopalatine fossa on a coronal section. So you can see how all these are connected now. Behind the orbit of the superior orbital fissure, the inferior orbital fissure, the inferior orbital fissure opens up into the pterygopalatine fossa. And the pterygopalatine fossa opens up into the nose through the sphenopalatine foramen over here. Here you have the vomer. You have to open up the vomer to be able to access the sphenoid sinus. The superior wall of the sphenoid sinus is formed by the plenum sphenoidal over here. On both sides, we can see the maxillary sinuses. As we come more posteriorly, this is the planum sphenoidal, the sphenoid sinus, the lesser wing of the sphenoid, same structures. Okay. Uh, inside the nasal cavity of the inferior turbinate over here and the vomer. As we come a little bit more posterior, you can start seeing the rostrum of the sphenoid. And the planum sphenoidal will start forming finally these upturned structures, that is your anterior clinal processes. The anterior clinal process connects to the sphenoid through the optic strut, which is over here. And 
in between the anterior clinoid process and the splenic sphenoid, you can form the optic nerve on both sides. Another structure you can pick out lateral to the sphenoid is the median canal. It's a horizontal canal running between the foramen lacerum and the pterygopalatine fossa. As we go more posterior along the MCF base, we'll start seeing some of the foramen that we have discussed running from intracranial to extracranial into the infratemporal fossa. So the first most medial one was the foramen of Vesalius for an emissary vein. This much bigger, more lateral one will be the foramen ovale. And as we go more posteriorly, you can see the foramen spinosum. This is the Vidian canal running within the sphenoid bone, lateral to it. As we go more posteriorly, this is the foramen lacerum. And here is the foramen spinosum, a little bit more lateral. Behind this, you start finding finally the petrus ICA over here. As we come more posteriorly, this is the, as you can make out, this is the ascending portion of the petrus ICA, which will then finally form the horizontal portion as we saw more anteriorly. You can see the tympanic cavity on both sides. This is the clival bone, and this is the anterior arch of the first vertebra. This is the petrooccipital fissure, separating both of them. More posteriorly over the IAC, the semicircular canals, and the EAC, this is the occipital condyle on both sides through which runs your hypoglossal canal. More lateral to that you have the jugular foramen and just at the superior edge of the occipital condyle and above the hypoglossal canal you have the jugular tubercle over here. We come more posteriorly you can see the semicircular canals, the IAC, the hypoglossal canal and the occipital condyle. This is the jugular tubercle on both sides. More posteriorly, just the foramen magnum. And that's the only important structure here. So now coming to sagittal imaging. So this, again, more or less the same structure than bony anatomy, but you can appreciate a few things quite nicely in sagittal imaging, especially the pituitary structures. Okay, so here you've got the sphenoid sinus. Uh, so a few important things to realize. This is the lower border of the sphenoid sinus. Anteriorly is formed by the rostrum of the sphenoid. Posteriorly, it is formed by the clivus. Posteriorly here, the posterior border of the cella is formed by the dorsum cella. Anterior border is formed by the tuberculum cella. The tuberculum cella then leads into the chiasmatic sulcus on which the chiasm lies. Just at the anterior border of the chiasmatic sulcus, you have something known as a limbus sphenoidal. And the limbus sphenoidal then turns and becomes flat and forms a planum sphenoidal. Okay, so you have a planum, then you have a limbus, then you have a chiasmatic sulcus, then you have a tuberculum cella, then you have the cella, then you have the dorsum cella, and that turns into the clivus. Okay, so this is the sphenoid bone. Okay, a few other important structures we can pick out is the frontal sinus and the crista galli, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, this whole structure over here, and below which you have the vomor over here. Okay, so as we come more laterally, you can see that, you can see some of the structures we've discussed, like uh, the ethmoidal cells and the maxillary sinus, sinus starts showing up. Behind the maxillary sinus, you have the pterygopalatine fossa. Connecting and then posteriorly over here, Remember, just next to the midline, you have the foramen lacerum first. Foramen lacerum and the pterygopalatine fossa will connect by the Vidian canal over here. You also make up the anterior clinoid process, the optic strut, and the optic canal over here. As you go more posteriorly, uh, sorry, you, as you go more laterally, you can uh, make out some of the other structures. Uh, the ethmoids have ended. Now we are entering the orbit. You have the maxillary sinus. Behind the maxillary sinus, you have the pterygopalatine fossa leading up into the inferior orbital fissure and the superior orbital fissure. The foramen lacerum over here, posteriorly. As we go more laterally, we can start seeing some of the other foramina. The foramen rotundum ending in the pterygopalatine fossa. And this is still the lacerum. You have the hypoglossal canal over here within the occipital condyle. As you go more lateral, 
You can see some of the other structures uh, that we discussed, the uh, foramen ovale, this is the IC ICA, this is the IAC, the internal acoustic canal, and this is the jugular foramen running inferior to the internal acoustic canal. The orbit, you can make out the inter infraorbital fissure, which will open up into this pterygopalatine fossa posteriorly. As you go more and more lateral, you will see the mastoid air cells and due to the mastoid of the cellular process between which you have the stylo mastoid foramen through which the seventh nerve will exit. This is a temporal mantle blood joint. And this will be the sphenoid, the greater wing of sphenoid. This will be the temporal fossa. Okay, so we'll just discuss the paranasal sinuses and probably call it a lecture for today. So, um, few just a few things about the paranasal sinuses and the important structures you should identify in relation to them. So we'll start from inferior and come superior. So these are maxillary sinuses that we'll encounter first. In relation to the maxillary sinuses, we've already discussed two important structures we need to keep in mind, the infraorbital canal over here and the nasolacrimal canal over here. The nasolacrimal canal will go and open into the inferior meatus. Okay, it runs between the orbit and the inferior meatus. Posterior to the maxillary sinus, we have the pyramidal process with its lateral and medial pterygoid plate. As you come more superiorly, remember, just posterior to the maxillary sinus, you'll have the pterygopalatine fossa. That's important to remember. And as you come more and more superiorly, the maxillary sinus uh, at its medial end will start developing ethmoidal L cells when the level of the orbit comes. So at the level of the orbit, you'll have the lamina papyracea and medial to which will lie the ethmoidal essence. So the post, you have the posterior ethmoids and then you have the anterior ethmoids. As you come more superior above the rostrum of the sphenoid, you'll start, start finding the sphenoid sinus. So this is the sphenoid. These are all your ethmoid sinuses on both sides. As we come more superior, finally, you'll also start seeing a portion of the frontal sinus. Okay, so frontal, ethmoids, and sphenoids on both sides. The important thing to remember in relation to each of these is the lamina papyracea on the lateral aspect of the ethmoids. Uh, the sphenoids with their relation to a lot of important structures, including the optic canal, the optic strut, the anterior clean out processes, the vidian canal, the foramen, uh, the, one second. Yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, so after the, Sphenoid sinus ends, we'll only be seeing the frontal sinus over here. This is the crista galli and the anterior clonal process on both sides. You can make out the optic canal on both sides, medial to the anterior clonal processes. On coronal sections, you have the first sinus, which you'll see from anterior to posterior, obviously the frontal sinus. As you, as you come more posterior, you'll see the frontal sinus drainage system. So this is where you'll find the frontal sinus recess also as we come more posterior. So this is the frontal sinus recess, frontal recess over here, which will finally open into the middle meatus. This is the middle meatus over here. Okay. You're also starting to see at this level some of the ethmoidal air cells and even the maxillary sinus. At the medial border of the maxillary sinus, you have the nasolacrimal canal, which will also open into the inferior meatus over here. As you go more posteriorly, you'll start seeing some of the important ethmoidal air cells. So this is the ethmoidal bulla, which protrudes into the middle meatus. And below the ethmoidal bulla, you have the ancillate process over here. The ethmoidal air cells superiorly attached to the fovea ethmoidalis over here. And next to which you have the cribriform plate. As we go more posteriorly, you'll start seeing the sphenoid sinuses and the planum sphenoidal. This is the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate. This is the superior turbinate. And this is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and inferior of the vomer. 
to go more posteriorly, the sphenoid sinus, as we discussed, is importantly related to the anterior clonal process and the optic canal and the foramen rotund mode. Sure. Mm. On sagittal section also, these sinuses are obvious. Frontal sinus, sphenoid sinus. To go more laterally, it's important to identify the ethmoidal air cells. The anterior most is the agate nasi. Then you have the ethmoidal bulla, which will be in the middle meatus. And then you have the ethmoidal air cells over here, anterior and posterior. Posterior to which you have the sphenoid sinus. As you come more laterally, you, the ethmoidal air cells become more obvious and the sphenoid and the frontal sinus will start disappearing. And the maxillary sinus will start becoming more obvious. So laterally, we will only see the maxillary sinus. Right, so that is all for today's lecture. We will probably discuss temporal bone CT because it's a lot more complicated topic in another lecture. So thank you so much for attending. If there are any questions, you can put them in the chat box.